Okay. Uh, what did we go over last week? John chapter 12. 12. Okay, John chapter 12. And we had covered the week before what big event? Palm Sunday, right? Triumphal entry, right? And so we had covered the triumphal entry. And then right after the triumphal entry, or about the same time as the triumphal entry, uh, what, who requests an audience with Jesus? The Greeks. There's a group of Greeks that want to come and see Jesus, and they approach Philip, and then they, uh, Philip gets Andrew, they go to Jesus, and they, ask, and they ask Jesus about the Greeks, and Jesus gives an answer, not directly answering the question yes or no, right? We, we went over that, that they, he didn't say, uh, no, I'm busy, or yeah, bring him on. He doesn't say that. He says what? <laughs> Something to do with wheat <laughs> and kernels. Uh, he says he says that that uh, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. Right? It was that kind of of uh, idea. We're going to read that. I don't have it on this one. Yes, I do. I have it on this one. All right. Okay, so he says, um, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my father will... If anyone serves me, my Father will honor him. So, Jesus gives this enigmatic answer where he answers the question, but not in the usual straightforward way you would expect, right? He gives the answer in that if you want audience with Christ, if you want to be in his presence... If you want to come to him, and remember when we were talking before about coming and believing, those are the same thing, and if you want to come to Christ, you must do what? You must die to self, you must surrender your life over to Christ, and you must Put yourself in, you must be united with him, walk like him, and that is the the point that he's giving is that whether Greek or Jew doesn't matter, right? What matters is, is unity with Christ, is that your life, you die, and your life is hidden in Christ. Okay, that's what he says, and so these Greeks can come to him, but they have to come by the proper way, through the door, right? Through the narrow gate. That's how they come to him. Okay, and so we're going to go on and we're going to read uh, from... Oh, what else do we have? And we also talked about, if you remember, that the, the difference between Adam, the first Adam and the last Adam. Christ and Adam, Right? This is, we're coming to this crucial moment in Christ's life, right, where it comes down to the greatest temptation of do you love your life more than you love God? Do you love yourself? In other words, life equating with self. Do you love yourself more than you love God? And we talked about the fact that Adam, the first man... The, he made that, when confronted with that decision, he loved himself more than he loved God. And he made the decision because we talked about the fact that Adam was not deceived. Adam understood the consequences, probably not fully, 
but hypothetically, because he never experienced death, but he understood that this was rebellion against God, what he was going to do by eating the fruit. He was not deceived, the woman was deceived. And Adam chose that he, he loved his life, he loved himself more than he loved God, and he chose his own path, he chose rebellion against God, and accepted the consequences of his actions. Right? And you've met lots of people like that. I've met people that says, yeah, I know I'm going to hell, but I'm not going to submit to God. Right? They have no idea what, that, what the implications of that is, but they're willing to accept that fate rather than submit to the will of God. Adam was willing to accept that fate rather than submit to the will of God. Yes, sir. Okay, that's a good question. Anybody want to address that? What is the difference between... Um, now, there is a big difference between Adam and us. What's the difference between Adam and us? Christ Christ is a big difference between Adam and us. Adam was not tainted by sin. He was not dead in his trespasses and sin. Right? Adam was not dead in his trespasses and sin. And therefore the decision he made, right, was not tainted by a sinful nature. The decisions that mankind makes... All of man is dead in, in their trespasses and sin. And so when your neighbor makes a decision, what can he make a right decision? Can he make a good decision? No. Even all of his righteous acts are as filthy rags, right? A person who is dead in their trespasses and sins cannot do anything but sin. We see their good works only in relative terms. But in actuality, even their good works are sin. Because they are not done for the glory of God. Right? So, Adam was not in that category. Adam could make a decision for good or evil. Christ could make a decision for good and evil. And Adam made the decision for evil, and Christ made the decision for good. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Well... We would say that, yeah, there had to be outside influence in order for them to be tempted to sin, right? So there would have been a temptation and a test, as we know from Scripture, that God tempts no one, but He does test, right? His motive is good. Satan's motive is evil. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, and he was a deceiver, right? So his purpose in tempting Adam and Eve was for evil purposes. God tested them to see, to reveal where their loyalty lay. He already knew, right? And obviously, the woman was deceived by Satan, but Adam was not deceived, and Adam, in full knowledge rebelled against God, right? So he was completely responsible for his actions. And so he made the decision to love his life more than he loved God, love himself, and you, you think about that and you think, oh, well, he knew he was going to die, so he didn't really love his life more than he loved God, right? He did not sin in order to preserve his life, as you would think it, he sinned because he loved himself more than he loved God. 
That is the point. That is why everybody sins. Because they love themselves more than they love God. Wow, you're asking some pretty heavy theological questions this morning. Okay. I don't know. Right? This is the, that's the, the good answer is I don't know because the Bible does not explain the internal workings of Adam's mind. Right? It does not explain. We know that this was all encompassed in the sovereign plan and will of God. We know that. Right? Just as when, when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, it says, you meant this for evil, but God meant this for good. So God's purposes are always good. He only does good. He doesn't do anything but good. And if you want a treatise on this, you should... Yes, sir. Sam is smirking. Sam is smirking because this comes into the direct providence question and the sovereignty of God, right? Was Adam free to make his own decision? But was that decision encompassed under the... Could he have done other than what he did? Right? That is the question. Uh, and there is the issue of man's responsibility, and we'll be getting into this, because this is all through John, obviously. We'll be getting into man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. Yes, Mom? Uh, Federal headship of Adam. Adam was responsible for Eve. He was the federal head of his family, Right? And therefore of all mankind, because there was only two of them. <laughs> right? So he is over all mankind. He's a representative of all mankind. And Eve was his responsibility, and he did not fulfill his responsibility. She was deceived, and he wasn't. He didn't do anything to prevent it. He didn't fulfill, he didn't reject her. When she came to him with the fruit, he ate the fruit. He did not say, no, this is wrong. And therefore, because of Adam, all mankind fell. And mankind died spiritually that day. And all men, after Adam, are born dead in their trespasses and sin. But Adam was completely responsible. Yes, Gabe? Well, this is the intro, you know. (laughs) We're supposed to be moving on from this. Yes, sir. Yes. There, there, there is, it's, it's even, it's a, there's a greater extent than that, right? The, the idea, the understanding is that God is glorified in His justice. God is glorified in His goodness. God is glorified in His love maximally in the way that things have played out, right? In the way that He has orchestrated it. But if you want a great treatise on this, uh, read Jonathan Edwards, the, what was the title of the book? Something for which, the reason for which God created the world, right? It's a great treatise, very heavy stuff, right? He lays out the argument and the cause and effect and the purpose of creation according to scriptures and the reasoning. And it's a, a, a fantastic book. But anyways, it has to do with the fact that everything, everything that happens is all for God's glory. And so everything is for good because that is the purpose. The greatest good is that which gives glory to God. That is the greatest good that could ever be. And so everything is to give God glory. That is the purpose for which it was created. And so Adam's fall and God's plan of redemption and ultimate justice and hell and heaven all bring glory to God. And so God's purpose in them is all for His glory, which is ultimate good. Capiche? Okay. Can we move on? Any other questions? 
It's, a, it's obviously a, an incredibly heavy subject because you're talking about the responsibility of man and the sovereignty of God, and you don't have all the information on the internal workings of what was going through Eve's mind, what was going through Adam's mind, what was going on in the background uh, with Satan, all of these things. When did Satan fall? Uh, why did he fall? The whole bit. You don't have that information. God does not choose to give you that information. And so to speculate into that is a dangerous territory. You do not want to go beyond what is written lest God reprove you and show you to be a liar. So we can only go on what has been revealed in His Word. That is for us. The secret things belong to God. Yes, sir? The difference between Adam and us is Adam was sinless. Before we were saved, we were... What's that? Oh, the answer is this. We glorified our non-posse, non-precari. And Adam was... <laughs> Adam was posse, not precari. Wow, my Latin is really bad. Okay, one means, is, one means that Adam was capable, it was possible for him to sin. Right? It was possible for Adam to sin, even though he was created sinless, it was possible for him to sin. When we're glorified, we are non posse, non picare. It, it, no, non posse picare. That's it. Non posse picare. It is not possible for us to sin. The man dead in his trespasses and sins is non posse, non picare, which means it's not possible for him not to sin. Got it? All right. We, in our redeemed state but unglorified we have the option of sinning or not sinning <laughs> right we have posse picari because we can choose to do things in christ and in faith right and those things are not sin and we can choose to do things not in faith and not in christ and we sin Right? But all of our sin, past, present, and future, is all paid for in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. So there is, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ because all of our life is hidden in Him. And so there is no eternal judgment for the sins that you as a Christian commit. They are all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ at the cross. So you are not held in judgment because that judgment has already been fulfilled in the wrath of God that was poured out on Jesus. All of your sins have been paid for. Your debt is wiped clean and is clean forever. There is no temporal sins there are no venial sins that you're going to have to burn off in purgatory. That doesn't exist. Right? His sacrifice was once for all. Okay? <laughs> yes, praise the Lord. Okay, we have a new nature now, but we struggle with our flesh. Right? And so because of our flesh, we sin. That's why we sin, still. Otherwise, we would not sin. The things we want to do, we do not do. The things we don't want to do, these we do. And the Spirit struggles against the flesh. Well, when you're glorified, that flesh will be glorified, and you won't struggle with the flesh anymore because it will be glorified, and therefore, you will no longer sin. You will not want to sin. It will not come into your thoughts to sin. It, you will be absolutely pure. Yes, Gabe? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand your question, though. Are you talking about uh, us before we were saved versus after we were saved? Before Adam. 
Right, he created it good without sin, perfect, no death. I'm still not sure I understand what your question is. Uh, once there wasn't sin in the world, right, God made the plan of salvation from eternity past, and uh, he is the lamb slain before the foundations of the earth. God speaks of those things that have not happened as if they did, right? So his plan was always to pay for the sin. The first uh, prophecy of that obviously is in the garden when he says that your offspring, he says to the woman, your offspring will crush the head of the serpent, right? So the plan was always to pay for the penalty of sin once sin entered into the world, right? And so then the plan of redemption carries through and will be completed upon the renewal of all things. So I'm not sure what, what your question is in relation to uh, God's plan of redemption. Right, it is, yeah, there is a difference between, uh, this, well, our sin is paid for in the now, but why do we keep sinning? Right, And the, the reasoning behind why we keep sinning is because we're still in the flesh. And the flesh has not been glorified yet. Once the flesh is glorified, there will be no sin. So would it be reasonable to say that Adam had a spirit dwelling within him? Would he, would he be sin? Well, that, that, that is a, a point. Yeah, I agree. If he was a partaker of the divine nature, right, and his, his, uh, he was hidden in Christ, and he partook in Christ's spirit, he had the spirit of Christ dwelling in him, he would not have sinned. That is true. Right, but we're still in the flesh. Right? So Adam's flesh was perfect. Right? So he could sin, but he didn't have to sin. And again... The unredeemed can't do anything but sin because they don't have a spirit of Christ. They aren't united with Christ. They aren't redeemed, right? And so they don't have a new life in Christ. And they are not a new creature in Christ. And therefore, they cannot do anything but sin. But once you are redeemed, you have the spirit of Christ. You're a new creature in Christ, right? And so you can sin or not sin, but not in the same way that Adam did because Adam did not have the flesh to contend with because he was created perfect. Yes. And so, after we are glorified, we don't have this, the flesh to contend with, but we are also one with Christ. We have the divine nature. We are partakers in the, the divine nature, which is a long way of saying Dallas was absolutely right. How do you like them apples? <laughs> yeah, you just stop. <laughs> wow, what a Sunday school class. I love it. Woo. <laughs> yeah, no, we have ten according to that fuck. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get through all I was worried that we weren't gonna have enough material this morning. Silly me. God's sovereignty in action right there. Okay, uh, so, re anybody else? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, just stop. Okay, so, reading John 12, 27 to 36. Now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowds of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowds then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever, and how can you say, The Son of Man must be lifted up? 
who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. So now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came. Okay, since we got problems, we might as well just keep going. Uh, there is some Greek trouble in this phrase that doesn't come across in the English because if, depending on your translation, the punctuation is different. What is the problem of manuscripts and punctuation? They had no punctuation. They had some punctuation, but very little, right? They had very little punctuation. So when you get a, a phrase like, uh, today you will be with me in paradise, if you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, they put commas in there so that it sounds like, uh, today you will be with me in paradise, right? Separating out, like, as if he was saying, today I'm saying this, you will be with me in paradise at some point in the future. Not, today you're going to be with me in paradise. One, one phrase, one sentence altogether. Right? And in this one, you see it says, Now my soul has been, become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. And the problem of punctuation here is, is whether it says, What shall I say? My, now my soul has become troubled, what shall I say? Period. Father, save me from this hour, as if it was a different sentence altogether. Right? So, now my soul has become troubled, what shall I say? And then he says, then he prays, Father, save me from this hour. Or, does it say, now my soul has become troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour that he's just continuing on in the sentence, and that is just, should I say, Father, save me from this hour? No. You see the difference? <laughs> Germans. <laughs> okay, one is saying, what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? Right? Uh, no. Now my soul has become troubled, what shall I say? Right? Uh, just that, what shall I say? And then he prays to God, Father, save me from this hour. Right? Do you get it? He says, now my soul's become troubled, what shall I say? And then, in a com and then he prays to God, Father, save me from this hour. Or, is that all one sentence, now my soul's become troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Should I say, Father, save me from this hour, is what he's saying? You see the difference there? One is he's praying for, to God to save him from this hour, and one is he's saying, no, I'm not going to pray to God, save me from this hour. You got that? Okay. And that's the problem of punctuation there within the Greek, is that it's difficult to determine both of those could be seen in that. That he, and there are, there, there is a debate on whether he's praying to God to save him from the hour or whether he's saying, I'm not going to pray to God to save me from the hour. Right? You could, you could say that, but if you wanted, and this was what we talked about last time, if you want to save the incongruity between this and the prayer in Gethsemane, then you would say that that was the case, that it is, that is, uh, should I, uh, what shall I say? And then he prays, Father, save me from this hour, which would be congruous with his prayer in Gethsemane, right? So in John here, he prays, Father, save me from this hour. And in the uh, garden, he says, let this cup pass from me. Right? Those two, that, that, that gets away from our paradox, and we go, yay! Right? But if you, I, it, 
as Hendrick has pointed out, I don't think that the context, I don't think that the passage supports that. The passage obviously gives us a paradox, right? And boy, it would be really unlike John to give us a paradox, wouldn't it? He is giving paradoxes frequently. And so what we see is, is that there is this paradox. There is this, should I say, Father, save me from this hour? And then in the garden he says, if it's possible and all things are possible for you, let this cup pass from me. Okay, we're out of time. <laughs> we'll go over that, maybe, if we don't have like another half hour intro <laughs> next week. <laughs>